Hello and welcome to the New Books Network. I'm Pierre Dalanson. Crisis? What crisis? These three words in the headline of the Sun newspaper helped to bring down the British Labour government in the late 1970s. In art, crises have abounded for even longer. Painting, for example, has repeatedly been pronounced dead, only to make a miraculous recovery each time. There's another aspect of the practice that seems to thrive in crisis. So much so that my guest today suggests that we should worry if we ever find that it is not in a state of crisis. The discipline is art criticism, and my guest is Patricia Bickers, whose recent book, The Ends of Art Criticism, proposes that the so-called crisis is unavoidable, productive, and perhaps a sham. Patricia Bickers is a writer and critic herself, but also a keen observer of the artistic scene. She is a long-time editor of the British art magazine Art Monthly, and she has lectured widely on art and art history. I'm very happy that Patricia joins me now to discuss her book, her work, and all things art. Welcome to the show, Patricia. Thank you very much. Well, it's quite a treat to have you here, not only because I'm excited about the book and, and your work, but also because we are meeting in person a day after restrictions have been lifted on Freedom Day in England. So this is quite a first in my series of, of interviews. And normally I ask my guests to introduce themselves in a kind of way that maybe lays out the intellectual ground, but doesn't necessarily connect to the research that we end up discussing. But I think with you it might be impossible to do that because Art Monthly and your role as editor, as an art critic in it and through it and throughout it is unavoidable. So maybe... Maybe I could ask you to introduce the magazine and yourself, how you came to write contemporary art criticism and what it is that we're contending with. Well, the I think I say right in the preface that the book um, relies heavily on my experience with Art Monthly because, in a way, it formed me. And as editor, I guess, ineluctably, I formed it along with my colleagues because we're a very, very small team. So I'm editor, but decisions are made collectively. So we've all come through this together. So I've learned so much from my colleagues. But like a lot of art critics in this country, where criticism is not professionalized, um, I fell into it. Um, I was actually doing a PhD in a totally unrelated subject if you want to know, <laughs> on Trecento art in Florence, very much art historical, and I was spending my summers in the Archivio di Stato in Florence. And I had always been fascinated by contemporary art because to me it was as exciting as the early Renaissance. It was a time of so much change, um, the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, it was just extraordinary, the pace of change. And it felt very familiar to me. As in the Renaissance. Um, so I went to a lot of shows, partly because I had gone on an off day, actually in Venice. I'd taken the train from Florence to Venice. And I saw these banners about the Biennale. And I thought, <laughs> oh, it's free on Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it is anymore. No, it was then. So off I went. And I was absolutely hooked. Um, so I was trying to balance these two things, an interest in contemporary art. And then one day I was talking to Lynn Cook, actually, the curator, and I said, you know, how do you start writing about contemporary art? And she said, well, you just have to do it. You know, I said, oh, but I can't possibly. <laughs> well, five years later, I did, and it got published. And um, it was quite hard to let go of footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, I realized you could fly if you let go. Um, but it did mean I found I could not abandon the sort of discipline of um, having some kind of structure to what I did. And I found Art Monthly, although as far away from an academic journey, journal, journal as you could find, suited me somehow. It was left wing. It was not about the individual. It was not a fag end of romanticism, which is what I found so much <laughs> in the British art scene. And I think 
the nadir of British art for me was an exhibition called The Hard One Image, which I discuss in the book. And everything about it, the idea that art was some kind of moral lesson to, to the, the unwashed, um, that art had this high ground, um, that artists were good by virtue of the effort and craft. They, this all felt so completely alien to me. And Art Monthly was trying to hold a corner for something that seemed radical in England, even though it was already quite established, which is conceptual art. I mean, Art Monthly was founded in 1976, for heaven's sake. And the rigour of conceptual art appealed to me, uh, I suppose partly because art history requires a certain rigour and is not about your personal voice so much. So all that appealed. And they published me, and then one day they said, would you like to do a bit more work for us? Because, um, as it turned out, <laughs> the editor was scarpering off to Australia to start another magazine. Not that I knew that. So the magazine landed in my lap as everybody departed to the four corners of the earth, it seemed to me. And uh, the first thing I did was go to the filing. Uh, in those days, it was index cards and throw out about two thirds of them. I thought, okay, I'm on my own in this office. It's 11 o'clock at night. What shall I do? I'm gonna pull this thing. It didn't review Freeze, for instance. Art Monthly did not review Freeze. Freeze mm -hmm. was, a, was a groundbreaking exhibition, partly because it was run by students, for students, while still students at Goldsmiths. And there wasn't one Freeze exhibition, there were three, and it was in a disused Port of London quarry authority building and um, they decided not to wait around for the hard one image types to catch up with them um, but to do it for themselves because in those days you took your portfolios to the galleries and were treated like aspiring actors you know cruelly so they decided to take it into their own hands and whatever people think of subsequently of some of the artists and the, and the whole phenomenon of freeze and the what became YBA, um, which doesn't include many of the artists who were in Freeze, by the way. It was groundbreaking. We all knew it at the time. And Freeze, uh, Art Monthly didn't review it. And I thought, this can't be right. So I realized that it's kind of run into the ground a bit. It sounds a bit arrogant of me to say, but, you know, when the, when the, Publishers are away and the editors in Australia. <laughs> you think, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's quite amazing, this, this story you just introduced. You started off with the idea of being at the right place at the right time, essentially. And I'm, I'm kind of amused by the idea of it's as far as you could go get away from an academic <laughs> art magazine because as we are now, um, you know, 20 odd, almost 30 years old on from this experience. Art Monthly probably is the most yes. academically minded of, yes. of, of, of all magazines. Well, okay. not academically, but serious. Perhaps. Yeah. So I think with this introduction, it will be clear to, to the listeners that we, we won't be straying away from the situation too far, that we are going to be, to be sticking with Art Monthly and its history. I need to ask you a kind of disarming and stupid question. What is art criticism? <laughs> what is it now? We 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 will get to the, to whether it's in a crisis or or not in a moment. But what function does it play, particularly now? What function does it play now, all these years since since you you destroyed all these index cards? <laughs> um, well, funny you should say it's a daft question because I asked a similar daft question of my professor in my second year doing art history as an undergraduate. And I said, Professor Bell, what is art history? And his response was, well, it's not art criticism. <laughs> Quite crossly. <laughs> That's helpful. <laughs> Never did answer my question, by the way. And I subsequently realized that art historians had a chip on their shoulder because, of course, they carved art history out of history. Um, and it gave them a certain sense of their own status to look down on criticism. Whereas, of course, Vasari was an art critic. He mm. certainly was a bad historian. <laughs> <laughs> his own prejudices distorting quite a lot of his material, but fascinating. And he knew the art and he engaged with it. Now, that's my view of criticism. 
Criticism to me is a close engagement with art and it is together with the desire to communicate that. In a way, you're an interface, that's all. People became misdirected, I think, by thinking it's all about value judgment, which is something we can talk about more later. But I think that's just misdirection and, well, arrogance. Um, and perhaps is all tied up with that whole idea that art is somehow moral or about morality. Um, for me, it is simply a conversation, but an informed one. I'm not interested in people who say, oh, know what I like. That's fine, but it's not what Art Monthly is about. As you say, it is a serious magazine. I hope it's funny too sometimes and <laughs> deeply irreverent. But yeah, it's a conversation. It's about close engagement, about sharing, and about passion, I hope. How do we then arrive at a crisis? What would you describe could be also a description of a certain type of journalism mm -hmm. and Absolutely. the kind of media production that, that proliferates sometimes with, you know, to great, great effect, sometimes to zero impact <laughs> yes. in the world at the moment. But you've alluded a little bit to, to historical models of art criticism going going away from the idea of art history. I love the, the fact that you bring up time and time again the 25-year rule yes. in the book, which is this idea that you know you have to wait 25 years since a work was made, or maybe even since the artist has passed, yes. before you can say anything objective about yes. what it is that they did. I particularly like the fact that you cite James Elkins lamenting the massively produced and massively ignored kind of mode of art criticism. So he's one of those people who clearly struggles with the idea of having certain parameters, having a clarity. And you set yourself out in a book very straight, straight on saying that you're not going to draw on, on theory. So there needs to be certain fluidity to, to the practice of art criticism. Maybe you could try to situate all these things vaguely historically, but mm. also to stake your ground in opposition to this kind of essentialist claims not necessarily about art practice, but art writing and art criticism. That well, the first thing is that he's right. There is a plethora of art criticism and different types of art criticism, some of it having little or no impact, perhaps, and, and some of it having more. But I consider that, and I say so, a spectrum, uh, a, conti con a continuum of criticism. I don't have a problem with it. And I don't think people today have a problem with it. I think Elkins is betraying his age and perhaps he's done a favour to me because uh, <laughs> um, I can react against that and um, it's partly because I'm surrounded by younger people and our writers direct as much of what the content of the magazine is directed by the writers who say we'd like to write about this and, and I go and see it. I might not have without their suggestion. So it's much more open. But to get back to this idea that, that somehow this, this continuum means that there's, there's no point, that it's all, of, all, all the same, this is directing it, if you like, from the director's seat, which says on the back, director or critic or chief critic. Whereas, in fact, you should trust the reader more. They can negotiate all these different outlets and they will find, I use the word osmosis, because osmosis is often mistakenly thought to be a process that actually dilutes. No, it isn't. Actually, osmosis collects and gradually distills. And I think that a lot of readers do that. They start perhaps with a blog and then gradually, if they're still interested, and it's our job as critics to keep them interested, they will come and gradually come to distill their ideas and their commitment and their engagement with art. And if you for one minute think as a critic that you can cover all those eventualities, you will fail. Find, it, find out what it is you want to do and find um, your voice in relation to the artists you want to write about. They will. It's a kind of mutual relationship. You can't be a scattergun critic. You'll end up writing guff for airport magazines, airline magazines. If you want to do that, you'll make more money, that's fine. 
is part of the continuum. I read them sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if you really want a closer engagement, by definition, you will enter this process of immersion yourself as a critic and your audience or readers with you, or they will find you and you will find them. What I mean is that the very thing that Elkin feels is a crisis, because there were parameters once, there was certainty, is actually liberating. Provided you don't feel you're speaking for everyone and to everyone, of course you're not. And that's, a, that's another point of crisis, because speaking to everyone is this beautiful position of authority that an art Absolutely. critic, the word critic, exactly. implies. What I really appreciated in, in your book, which is at many levels um, and, and many parts, a kind of very off the moment account of you know, where we are. You've, you've, you've clearly finished writing it during the pandemic with, with quite a lot of up to the minute experiences, but you, you bring up you know, discussions and lawsuits between Whistler and, and Ruskin. And I think, I think it would be super interesting to, to go a little bit into some of those histories of certainties of what it is that criticism, the, the functions no longer really serves. And I'm particularly interested in how you see the proliferation, not just of criticism, but of art production. I mean, it would be difficult mm -hmm. to argue that we do not experience, do not have access to, I'm going to guess, a hundred times more contemporary art in, this, in, in the streets of London than we did in the, in the 1980s. So that's, that's something that produces a whole industry with it, with which criticism needs to evolve. The irony is that Ruskin, was, despite all the claims made for his virtue, if you like, was playing to the market just as much as rent -a critic is today because of his authority. I mean, it's very corrupting. It was corrupting to him. He began to believe his own judgment was sacrosanct. The judge himself, as I mentioned in the trial, that it came to trial between Whistler and Ruskin famously, saw Ruskin in the same light as he saw himself, as administering judgments according to criteria. And Ruskin felt himself to be completely above the market while actually endorsing it all the time. And we have the same decision to make today. He was facilitating a market for a smaller, and they would claim more discerning market. And so are critics who descend to that level. You have to make that decision. It is an ethical one. Do you want to go down that route? Do you want to chase after the latest thing? Haven't we all seen people, curators, critics, running around the Venice Biennale? And some, these days <laughs> you have to run around <laughs> to, to see as much as you can in mm. the press days when it's free. Um, and you can tell, and I, we used to have a sweepstake, you know, so-and-so is going to be showing so-and-so because they won the what's it, whatever prize, you know, and they'll all be scrambling over each other to show. Nobody says they won the prize, but are they any good? Because there is this thing that's actually, I, I wrote it um, some years ago, and it was picked up by here and there, um, and became something of a mantra, <laughs> prize winners win prizes. It sounds a ridiculous thing to say, yeah. but prize winners win. Because, and here's to come back to your question, and, and we do hover around judgment all the time. Because people are insecure, now you'll see press releases will start. Turn a prize nominated, or better still, turn a prize winner. And there are lesser prizes in the world, Hugo Boss or the Van Gogh Prize. I mean, lesser in the British press eyes. And... This is their only yardstick. In the past, it might have been what Ruskin approved or Clement Greenberg approved or what Gagosian shows, because these have the gold standard. But this is the market gold standard. I'm not interested in the gold standard. I'm interested in the most interesting conversation. And that critics can flush those out. Critics can say, have you seen this? Because the market won't tell you, they haven't seen it yet. <laughs> they can't be asked to go to wherever this small gallery is. And the small gallery, of course, becomes a feeder for the market. 
And the danger is that the critic who identifies these things also inad inadvertently feeds the market. That's something we can't control. But we had the conversation first. And it may well be that it was the most in ah. interesting conversation that artists ever had. Well, that's incredibly interesting and, and beautiful because you argue in the book at various points that artists bring with them their own standards of judgment. Sometimes these are aesthetics, sometimes these are moral. So I wonder whether you could speak a little bit about the kind of diversity and plurality of voices that you have encountered over the years and how that might have informed your idea of the standards of judgment that, and the kind of conversations that you seek out with artists now? I don't know. The standards exist, but they, they're not absolute. One of the reasons I mentioned that um, when Barnett Newman said aesthetics is for the birds, with that American play on words, aesthetics is like ornithology is for the birds, was um, a very amusing way of saying it. Aesthetics is for the birds, unless it is in response to the artist's uh, aims, ambitions for their work. Without reference to the artist's ideas, then to apply aesthetics to that work is a kind of meaningless. This is, this is what I mean when, when theory starts to develop its own trajectory away from the work, and then you're into exegesis and you're into other things, getting too far from the work. So. Of course, you also have to subject the artist's claims to scrutiny. Um, you have a, a, a duty as well as a right to do that as a critic or any other person who engages with the art in whatever role or level. So the work will have standards of its own. The artist will be answerable to themselves, if you like. And you need to engage with the parameters that the work is working within. Sometimes it is in reference to art history or to contemporaries. One of the things I always found interesting as teaching art students as opposed to art historians is they're never looking where the market's looking or where museums are looking. And I can remember uh, a contemporary artist suddenly wanting to talk to me about Caravaggio. And I think, well, whatever led them to Caravaggio? So in a way, artists bring something to the table and you have to come to terms with it. But you bring something as well. That's what I mean. Why I always call it a conversation, not um, discourse, <laughs> <laughs> which is too formalized, is precisely because a conversation is like we're having intimate, face-to-face, -face, if possible. If not, at least face-to-face -face with the work. And for goodness sake, write about work you haven't seen. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> that happens more happens. often than we like to, like to admit, I'm sure. I mean, one, when I say conversation, it's one of the reasons why at Art Monthly we never preview anything. How can you preview mm. something? I find that shameful that magazines <laughs> have previews. So in the same way, though, there aren't these outside external standards, but teachers of art as practice rather than theory and history, in my case, grill the artist. That's what a crit's all about, isn't it? And we call it a crit. <laughs> and and critis criticism is related to the crit. What are you doing here? How do I relate to it? What do I think you're doing? And it means you engage with the material. I can remember people writing criticism that never mentioned how the work was made or what dimensions or what medium was used, as if that was irrelevant. Whereas all these are choices made by the artist and you have a duty as a critic to engage with these are all the conditions of making and part of, for any left person, the context. And that context includes the social, the political, the economic. So you can't just go into a room and say, well, I think this is great. End of conversation. That's just applying your authority. And why should anyone care that you think it's great? Hmm. Well, this is a point in the book where your ideas of criticism encounter the notion of the public sphere and the very many ways in which what the public sphere is is both under attack and is undergoing constant transformation under the conditions of neoliberalism and so on and so on. So I wonder whether you could speak a little bit about 
the role that criticism, in your view, plays in addressing the various parameters under which contemporary art is produced. And I mean by this, you know, all the changes in the um, the shapes and the founding funding mechanisms and the institutions of art education, art production, but also the broader changes to society and its understanding of culture and creativity, those kind of paradigms that have been replacing more rarefied notions of art itself? There are two ways this could go. One is that you understand those conditions and talk about them in the course of writing a feature or even a review if it's relevant. The other one is whether critis criticism in some senses helps produce art, which is, which is a different question, and I have deep reservations about that. Now, there was a very, there was a moment, particularly art text, when photographic image text work, where critics very much felt in some ways they were producing the work of the artist, um, which I, I think is simply not, not the case. <laughs> I think I think some artists flattered some critics into thinking that may be the case, and some artists, some critics abrogated that idea to themselves. But the other idea, the other side of this, is that Art Monthly and other critical platforms um, should be there so that, and we, we know this from letters, we know this from social media, feel their pain, <laughs> have been through it, have observed it, have engaged with it as part of the context in which art is made and understood. And it's clear if you draw a lot of your critics, I mean, there was a time when it, there was a cordon sanitaire between practitioners, as they're called now, or artists, as I prefer to call them, and, <laughs> um, and uh, critics who came yeah. in with desperate consequences from the literary background in Britain. And there was somehow like there was some kind of ethical divide between the two. And um, then when artists started to write about art, and of course for me, Donald Judd is a, is a, is a model, um, not of many other things, but of the ability to engage closely with art and to find another way that was not literary and exegetical and parallel, but coterminous, as I, I use that word, that was very popular in, in, the, in the period of minimalism and derivations of minimalism, that idea that somehow the work and its making were coterminous and they constituted together its meaning. What I didn't like about that was it left out the context. So it was limited, but it was refreshing because it discarded all that narrative and all that exegetical baggage and engaged with the art. So what I would demand of criticism is it does all that Judd wanted it to do, but it also takes on the context. And in doing that, you have empathy with the artist and the conditions in which art are made. Because despite the media coverage of them and the enormous wealth of people like Jeff Coombs and Damon Hirst, they are the exception, they are not the rule. And out there are thousands of artists making a difference. And sometimes they may never be heard except through their pupils, through their students. But it's crucial because this is all part of what I prefer to call the art ecosystem. And it's a, it's a phrase uh, David Barrett uses a lot. He's our deputy editor. Um, the art ecosystem is something we have to remind the Art Council of, that take one part out and the whole thing collapses. And so we are part of an art ecosystem. If you think you're outside it, passing judgment or adding value, <laughs> or operating in the market, that's fine. But I'm not interested in that. I'm interested still to, to think about the barriers to entry to that conversation being had, because it, it strikes me that to participate in the ecosystem, one has to still be able to pass some kind of you know, standard of judgment. You write in the book about the, not only proliferation, but the existence of um, 
things like MFA in art and writing. And you just now referred to the not so fantastic consequences of art critics in the UK stemming quite often from literary studies. In and the that, past, yeah. And that strikes me as something that's maybe very different in the US. Quite a lot of the authors that I've interviewed speaking and writing about contemporary art have come from from literary studies and, and I found a lot of those perspective refreshing, maybe because they're so unusual to, to European European ears. What does what does school do for the art critic? Nothing. Well that was let's <laughs> move on. <laughs> It's, it's strange. We, we bypassed engaging with criticism in its history and went straight to theory. And whereas America, I, we did have a deputy editor, Jeff Kastner, who went on to work with Cabinet magazine in the US when he couldn't get residency here. And he had done journalism. And that is unknown pretty much in, in the UK. I didn't, wasn't disparaging people from a literary background. I was only saying that in the past, only people from a literary background wrote criticism in the UK. They weren't art historians who, had, who despised criticism or claimed to. It, like Berenson claimed to be this, you know, learned art historian who, after his death, it was discovered he was actually playing the market like anybody else, just like, in fact, more so than Ruskin, who inadvertently led the market because of his great authority. So we, did, we, didn't, we didn't learn journalism. We weren't taught criticism. Um, as I said at the beginning, I fell into it, which is often the way. Subsequently, a lot of artists write criticism, which used to be, as I mentioned earlier, anathema, but which we have always encouraged precisely because of the idea that it's a close conversation about and with artists. You note in the book that it's been quite a while since a contributor to the magazine mm. has actually opted to be referred to as an art critic. So, yeah. so who, who are the contributors? Who is your archetypal art critic who isn't an art critic now? Well, there, there isn't an archetypal uh, art critic. Um, I think there probably was in the 19th century, but there certainly isn't now. But we ask them to describe themselves. And I think you, you might notice throughout the book, and I think I missed one, which irritates me. Um, throughout the book, I always describe people by their self-descriptive. So we'll say art historian and writer, or critic and writer, or teacher. Not, not sure, there, there, there teacher. must be a word count limit. I mean, I think my biography is like seven <laughs> words by now, and it's a sort of shame every time I come across it. <laughs> Very few, even though they make all their living as teachers, ever describe themselves as lecturers or teachers, unless they describe themselves as reader in the department of something, yeah. if they have a title. And as I mentioned, some people who I personally know have only curated one show who describe themselves as curator rather than critic. Now, I look into this as much as I could. And I've said before that I think the fall of Gra from grace of Clement Greenberg, the last great white <laughs> um, dispenser of artistic judgment, um, his fall from grace was not, I think, the cause of this disappearing critic, but a symptom, because he carried on working long after his star had fallen, if you like, or his influence had faded. And when he himself began to realize he had somehow cut himself off, <laughs> boxed himself in, really. And I think it's just that they don't want to be associated with something they feel has a history that they don't have not been taught but yet feel is somehow negative and i think it circulates around this idea of judgment i often think that the rising terminal that is increasing in this country now i don't know if it originated in australia or america but the rising terminal is symptomatic of people's desire to end up on a questioning note rather than sound like they have made a judgment that excludes people or other opinions and maybe criticism or being a critic 
shuts things down in their view, whereas writer keeps it open. That's the, that's the best interpretation I can think of. For me, and this is probably a feature of my age, you had to be a serious writer to describe yourself as a writer. I would never describe myself as a writer. Um, whereas a 22-year-old who's written two pieces of criticism and her dissertation will happily call herself a writer. So it's a, it's a, dif a difference in generation, I think I'm guilty of that, that I find it strange. But I also feel that in a benign sense, people don't like the way the word critic perhaps shuts things down. This has only occurred to me now. I mean, you make a nod to all of this in the book as well. You, you, you cite, cite Irit Rogoff and her idea of criticality, which is a way of dismantling the, the distinction between the inside and the outside. So your 22-year-old writer is a writer because this is a way to participate in the relationships that produce criticality, even if the terminology doesn't necessarily follow through. I mean, we've, we've got rid of Clement Greenberg and his uh, keeping of all things political really, really far as, as you know, at arm's reach as, as he could. We've got to the point now where the criticality does indeed lie very close to the writer. So I want us to, to spend a moment talking about the different ways in which we can think about art criticism as a political act. And I think it will be important to, to maybe think a little bit about the kind of politics that the artistic practices that you as a critic or Art Monthly as a magazine is interested in, the, the politics that those practices espouse, and then maybe to make a distinction between the artistic practice and the critical practice, how the politics come together. The thing about criticality and almost the performative element of criticism that somehow you are part of it and you're not outside it, um, as you know, I have some reservations about that. I think there's something called respect and difference mm -hmm. <laughs> and a certain distance, but not sacrosanct, not the 25-year-old, not, not a critical distance that denies that you're not part of the same continuum, but just a respectful distance that you may not actually know what this work is about. <laughs> and you may not know anything about the artist. You should not assume yeah. that. And I feel that if you, criticality is in danger of what I call the wonder of me syndrome. And this was very true of 19th century and early 20th century exegetical criticism where you know you look at work and it sparks off uh, a discourse or, or, or rather a, a personal journey. You know, you look at this work and I think of this, and, and off you go, wandering away from the work, literally and figuratively. And there's a similar problem with criticality, in that in the end it's about you. Now everything we do is about ourselves. I know that. We all know that. But that's where it comes back when I talked about art history, when I talked about art monthly and the attraction to me of a certain degree of rigor, a certain degree of respect, a degree of distance. And that's where the politics comes in. Respect for other people, respect for their boundaries. Now, boundaries, as I've said before, are not barriers, they're not borders, they're permeable. And we are here at the point of those boundaries, negotiating them. And that's a political term, you know, we, we have to negotiate these boundaries. Whether you wear your mask today on the tube or not, have respect for the person next to you. So how is that different from a relationship with art and the critical relationship with art? I don't see these, this difference. I think there's a problem with how we teach this. When you rightly talk about how still people don't feel the access and all the happy, clappy Arts Council notion of let's create and um, getting artists to do social work effectively, doing political, the work of politicians, not political work. This is not the answer. It denies people their right to access art, not creativity, their own by all means. But art is a thing. I refuse, <laughs> I refuse to let this term be 
replaced by creativity. Creativity is the mean, but it's not what you arrive at or are try, striving to arrive at. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that I can't really see that there's a politics and then there's an art and how you negotiate them. You're in it. And so you're attracted by the kind of art that is respectful. For instance, if it's dealing with um, a subject of war, I don't mean that you like the BBC, you have to be balanced and look at both sides. But I have problems with war photographers who go in there and photograph victims, you know, and they're, oh, sign this to stay. You know. um, in the same way, you are attracted to artists who respect those same boundaries, those same values. And so it becomes self-selecting in a way. You are picked out by the artist and the work, and or you identify a dilemma that you faced. And those I'm not prescribing, I, because if you, if you prescribe, then A, you shut down things for yourself, but you're shutting it down for the listener, the reader. I just feel go out there with this in mind, find something that you relate to, that respects certain boundaries you have, because you are part of the context. And it's one of the reasons painting is so problematic, apart from its history. But problematic, a lot of painting at the moment that's being marketed is market friendly and has masses of positive, you know, we had three sale rooms um, articles in the, la in the last three issues where Colin Gladell, who's been our long-term um, market reporter, that's exactly why Art Monthly attracted me, because it didn't deny the market. <laughs> it has an art law column, it has letters, it has free listings. It's trying to say all of this is part of the context of art. There are legal issues that you may need to know about. You may need defense. The market is there, is real, it's not gonna go away, but you need to know how it works. And that when something fetches a, last pri a large price, it doesn't make it a great work of art. I know this is an obvious thing, if you're 18 or 19 starting art school, you might be dazzled by that. You might think, God, it's about how the market works. And the, our market journalist, he calls himself a journalist, he is a professional journalist, he will tell you how that works. Who is bidding against whom and why? Who is in that keeping the price up and buying it in house so that the price is not seen to go down? This is all. I'm probably wandering from the point, but for me, this is all part of the same thing. Well, you've alluded to a few things that I find a little bit in tension with one another. Um, you spoke about this idea of self-selection, which is, I guess, happens in every human endeavor. So Art Monthly and the kind of people that you work with are grouped because of certain political and, and ethical ideas. Um, but you also talk about respect and you talk about openness. And at the same time, you speak about the need for detailed adversarial information, the way you just described either the, the law column or the, the sales reports. So, I, Ben, I want to ask you to, to reflect a little bit on the possibility of some kind of political neutrality that the terms you invoked possibly bring. Um. We are clearly of the left. I mean, clearly. We believe in public funding. We believe in the public sphere. So, yes, there is a political position, but it's not party political. It's not dogmatic. Um, it's not factional, because we don't want to have factional wars. We're not Marxist in any sense that Marxists would recognize, because we're not orthodox. Because if you engage with art and with people in a empathetic way, in a way that understands, respects difference, then you, you have to be more flexible than any dogma would allow for. But to be clearly on the left 
is, is not to shut things down politically, but it is a signal, it is a sign, it is a, a side, no question. Our readership survey is quite interesting as to where we're read and where we're not. <laughs> and it's of absolutely no surprises. Mm. And we're not looking. I remember many years ago, my, one of my first public talks at Tate in the days when I used to do those, and someone said to me, after I'd spoken about the magazine, is Art Monthly very narrow in its focus? I said, yes. He said, puzzled, and he said, I mean, should it be wider in its focus? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and they were really surprised. But that's the truth. If you try to be all things to all people, you will be nothing to anyone. I have to say this to the Arts Council all the time. We have to have something that defines us. If you like in the marketplace, because we are out there, we are a business, we do sell. We're not some public funded uh, sad case. You know, we are a business, one that functions because we don't pay ourselves very well. <laughs> but that's that's usually the case on the left. And so we do stand for something. We, we are not all things to all people. We're not for everyone, but we're there if you want us. So what happens in the writing itself? Mm -hmm. What are the political possibilities of art criticism as you see it now, apart from being present in structures like Art Monthly that, that serve a very particular political purpose to a constituency? Well, to come back to the point we started with, really, the idea of pluralism, too much criticism and it not being, you know, <laughs> and nobody listening, nobody, the opposite is the case. I feel so much that in the past I worried. When I joined the magazine, it's no secret that we sold a ludicrous, I, I felt when I looked at the statistics when everyone was away and I was in the office on my mm. own at 11 o'clock at night going through the cards, and I looked, I thought, I could almost know all the people who buy our monthly. <laughs> it was shocking. And I thought, now this is everything I don't want a left-wing magazine to be. And so now we are about 20,000, but the most important thing is that it's, the ripple effect, or as I say, osmosis, because you've got both. You've got ripples to move out, and then they can come back in, and that's where the process of refining comes down. Because people tweet, people quote, people cite, and then they come back to us. It goes out, and then it comes back. Sort of like a, I, know, I keep mixing my metaphors here. <laughs> but anyway, I'm absolutely comforted now. First of all, I changed, you know, over the years, we changed the magazine a lot and we started to reach out, we started to listen more, we started to ask our writers what they wanted to read and get out there more and, and, and chuck away <laughs> some of those people who'd been writing for years and not really paying attention to what was happening. And so the magazine changed. We began to pick up some momentum. We ran. So my point is that the very plurality, the very amount of art criticism in Britain is actually the best thing because it means that you have other ways of reaching out. You don't know, it's like shouting in the desert, you don't know who will hear you, but social media and the newsletter has is, is, is just exploded. So we're reaching people and that will bring, the newsletter is designed to bring people back to the magazine. So as soon as social and new media, digital media, enabled us to reach out further, we've done this from the moment I joined the magazine and all the new people came on board. And we do this together, believe me. We're, as I said, we're a tiny team, about five or six people. And conversations, we can change it on a pin. We can say, that's not gonna work. And it's done. You know, we're not some unwieldy organisation. That's what keeps us responsive. Quick, we can move on our feet. And so every time there's a new avenue where we can reach out, we'll take it. We don't want to be exclusive. And, and people who are tuning in to us through our resonance radio programme, which is free to air, and because we're a charity now, so we have most of our stuff set up the foundation in 2017. The um, listings are free, the maps are free. You know, we're trying everything we can 
as a tiny organization to reach out. But I, it's not, if people don't want to engage, that's their right. Who says art's the only thing you've got to care about? In this world? <laughs> well, there are some people who think that it's not art, but it's art criticism that, that we should care about. So I, you were talking about tweeting, and we, I'm going to try to steer us back to an earlier moment in which you mused whether art writing was art itself. I'm going to read a tweet from um, Jerry Saltz, America's best-known art critic. So this, I, I might completely chuckle up as I go through this. A good critic always puts more into writing about work than the artist put into making it. The artist only creates. The critic must plan that creation and also write creatively enough to deliver the full volume while also creating a thing of beauty and clarity itself. Now, I, I can imagine what you're going to have to say, say to this, but I also want you to, to, to use this as a way to talk about your conversations with artists. So one of the things I know you have done and Art Monthly has done is that it has carried quite hefty interviews with artists for a long time and you've published a couple of volumes, anthologies of those. So it would be great to know what you, how you see interviews as a critical form and how they have informed your approach to both the magazine and the art of criticism, if indeed is an art. Oh. it is an art at all. <laughs> well, it's very interesting. I had a conversation with Julian Stalabras, who is a Marxist and writes for um, Marxist publication. And he objected to the fact that we publish interviews because, of course, bourgeois individualism, you know, the artist as an individual creator. Um, I don't want to bowderize what he said, but just to reduce it to the basics. And I said, well, you know, I'm an art historian. It's primary evidence. It's primary material. It's a no-brainer. That's the first thing. Second thing, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Everybody knows. An interview is a fiction. <laughs> it's a work in a way. But my goodness, why would you not ask an artist all those questions you've wanted to ask and all those questions that you know some other people probably want to ask and haven't had the opportunity so you have a platform where you can and sometimes most often we hope the artist also would like to amplify something or correct something you bring the same thing you bring all the same tools to the table you are respectful not overawed, politically we're equals, but in different spheres, Jerry Saltz put it. <laughs> <laughs> and when it works, but the most important thing, and this is true of any art historian or critic, do your homework. My God, nothing makes me angrier <laughs> when I realize <laughs> that leading question, tell me about your latest work. We call this the an HUO question. A hands or question. I feel like I'm like my interview technique is under scrutiny now. So I'll, I'll stay quiet from now on. <laughs> no, do. do your homework. You know, that's about respect. And similarly, I expect the artist to also show respect for the interviewer who has taken the trouble. It's very nerve wracking. <laughs> um, the phenomenon of the interview, um, Ivana Blaswick makes this point in, one, in the introduction to one of our, our first volume of interviews, you know, that in many ways the interview coincides with, with the media um, when tape recorders became available. I slightly disagreed um, with my art historian's hat on because oh. there are many um, epistolary interviews that have taken place in the past, famously with... Uh, Poussin, um, um, and those were intended for publication and they were intended and they were formed and they were just as artificial. And so the interview and, and the words from the artist's mouth have always been rivetingly interesting. So it is a basic tool of the trade. How it informs criticism, it can be a corrective, but at the same time, you still have to bring the same discipline because Artists can charm you, they can deflect you, they can bullshit you. 
um, as no, never. anyone <laughs> never. else. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sometimes you have to ask the difficult question. I remember one in particular when I was um, speaking to Richard Serra, who's quite a scary looking guy, you know, his black t-shirt and his black trousers and his black shoes and his <laughs> close cropped silver hair and his physique. He was talking about how the a, a piece he called Weight and Measure that was done for Tate, mm -hmm. it had come in on tram rails because of the floor it had come through the front entrance along the tram rails. It was very hard to install because the weight was solid steel and the measure was hollow and all both hand forged. And he was talking about how he wanted to deal with this overweening, powerful, demanding space. And I said, how would you feel if I said Tate was having to deal with an over <laughs> demanding <laughs> 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 and credit to him, he laughed and said, I'd agree with you. <laughs> so it it is a I would call it a golden opportunity. And of course, what was a critical conversation becomes art history. So they're part of a continuum. So I couldn't be happier, could I? <laughs> oh, brilliant. Well, I look forward to this going on the record as well. <laughs> Patricia, um, I'm going to I'm going to ask you a, a usual question, but maybe maybe you can you can weave in a little bit of inspiration and and advice for for, for any of our younger listeners who might be keen to follow in your footsteps. So I, I'd like to know what it is that you plan for the magazine for the next 30, 35 years <laughs> for yourself. <laughs> well, but then and you and where, you see, where you see criticism <laughs> going and, and who's going to be doing it and, and how. Well, the most exciting thing for me has been how, how much I've learned through lockdown, through being, yes, trapped by the medium of the computer, um, Zooming, um, emailing, uh, streaming, and so on. But the revelation of all those artists trapped in their home permanently, the disabled artists, those who self-identify as disabled, how uh, gay, trans people have found a completely free space for them um, to talk about things, to communicate with each other, with, with each other. a safe space. Um, of course, we all know social media is deadly. But creating their own archives, Brathwaite Shirley's archive, you know, it's, it's, it's where it says, if you're not trans, don't enter, you know. It's brilliant. This is so exciting. People's voices being heard, or rather, people making their voices heard. And however tired we are of Zooming, however tired we are being confined to the home, it's a new level of empathy that opens up so many new perspectives. The arrogance of thinking you could possibly know what it's like, and you don't. Um, I was just listening to um, Tanny Gray, Dame Tanny Gray, the disabled um, wheelchair sprinter. And she was saying that what she loved about 2012 was the Paralympics was packed out every day. And she said, at last, the conversation was not about disability, but about your speeds, about your, mm. you know, your competitiveness, about world records. And this, this ripple effect has been just amazing that people have found the means to expand the art world. It was always there. We just didn't know. I mean, we thought we were reaching out. And this is a point I make that, and you were talking about earlier before we were recording, that the art world pats itself on the back and thinks it's this model. But actually, the inequalities in the art world are just as bad as anywhere else. And it's been an absolute revelation and exciting. I mean, every time you think, oh, we've been there, done that. No, you haven't. So if you're young and you want to be interested in this world, you'll find another avenue that we haven't even thought of. It's just, it is actually a very exciting time. It's oppressive, politically speaking, <laughs> uh, particularly if you're on the left. But in other ways, at least now we're talking about abuse online. 
at least we're understanding things that we that were just it's like much malign media studies telling students you know have you noticed that that politician is being filmed against a busy street with traffic going by and this one is in a book line study which one do you think is a Tory which one do you <laughs> think is anything but so it, it's it's learning how to negotiate these new territories and that's for other people you know I, I've probably done my time <laughs> And that's what's so exciting because they will come to us and we'll be there. I may not be, but I hope we will be. Well, thank you so much for bringing <laughs> us here, Patricia. <laughs> thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> Well, a conversation, in fact, continued for quite some time after this point, and we decided to publish it as a bonus episode. You'll find a link to that and to some of the artistic practices we mentioned in the show notes. The End of Art Criticism by Patricia Bickers is published by Lund Humphreys. I'm Pierre Dance, and the editor is Marshall Perry. Thank you for listening, and join us next time. Hello, this bonus episode contains some extra material from my conversation with Patricia Bickers about her book, The Ends of Art Criticism. You describe the Art Academy, the Contemporary Art Academy, as being formed in reaction to one well, essentially a 15th and maybe later 18th century model and this kind of idea of an atelier that, that starts up in Paris changes absolutely everything. But we are now quite a significant moment away from this and the rules of the academy seem to be completely different. So I, I asked you earlier about the idea of, of art writing as an artistic discipline and art writing as something that is being taught But it's clear that actually we are, even before we get to writing, we're at a moment where we, we've really landed in a very, very strange position as to what it is the Art Academy does to art students, how we think about art education and its role in society, its role in forms of knowledge production. So it would be, it would be great to hear an art critic's view of what it is the artists know and what the Academy has done for them. Well... Of course, as an art historian, with all its faults, and my goodness, there are plenty, I do regret the lack of art history that's taught. And that is evident to me from all sorts of simple mistakes made in texts that are submitted by otherwise you know, brilliant writers. So that is a regret. I also think art history, with its disciplines, not that artists... I used to say to my students, I do the art history so that you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> you can do what you like with what I'm teaching you. I'm not turning into art historian. I'm offering this to you as a resource. So I regret that very much because I feel to know the history is empowering and to reject it, that's your choice. That's also empowering. The recourse to theory, as I quote um, Maria Walsh, She's quite right. It's been, that has been very empowering, particularly to people who feel themselves to be in a minority. It's helped them discover their identity and articulate it and so on. Um, but it must always be remembered that it's applied theory. And when theory takes its own trajectory in art writing or in critical writing, it ceases to be critical writing. And then it turns the editor or the reader um, into a tutor in a way, you know. <laughs> into an academic. There are other, as I always see things, try to see things in context, there are other determinants really, um, which are forcing us towards this more and more, not just written, but theoretical side and practice in terms of making, not necessarily as an end in itself, but as a, as a discipline among others, as a, um, is being sidelined, of course, there are economic determinants. 
the monetization of education, instead of being publicly funded and being a right, a civil right to be educated, um, has become monetized. Therefore, um, and this is, I'm speaking, of course, from the left, this means that space is at a premium. Tutors, you don't want full-time ones because they might have a pension. So you have part-time ones. They're often on insecure contracts, short-term contracts. The students, there's too many of them. They can't be present because they, they represent money. So these are practical things. These are practical reasons why education is up shit creek. Sorry, very vulgar of me. It's why education... I think it's, it's, I think it's a fair description <laughs> of, of at least the humanities education in the UK. And most distressing of all, it's become so expensive that it is becoming the perquisite of the wealthy, the privileged. And when I taught at the University of Westminster before I left, we had the proudest record of having the most people of black and ethnic minority communities coming to university for the first time, and even white families, first time, first member of family to ever go to university. That ended immediately with a £9,000 fee. So money is at the root of this. Privatisation, which is what's happening in education, because the response to this, to, because it's monetized, is to keep students permanently in education. None of the Goldsmith students, like them or loathe them, who were in the freeze exhibitions we referred to earlier, did an MA. They thought, and I did, of their generation, I thought MA was for rich kids or people who wanted a studio for two years. All of us wanted to teach on the BA. Nobody wanted to teach on the MA because it had foundation. Foundation was wiped out. Foundation was fantastic. Two years where you could do anything and discover who you were, which was probably a singer, not an artist. Fine. Then you became, went to BA. You were half formed and became fully formed. Who needed an MA? Get rid of foundation, suddenly you wanted an MA. Now, when you introduce fees, how about a PhD? How about postgraduate? Before you know it, you are 10 years paying fees. So, where does criticism come in this? Well, there is a good payoff from all this. For me, anyway. <laughs> because... <laughs> <laughs> I mean me as an editor, because where can you write freely? Where can you say what you really think in Art Monthly or in a another art magazine or outlet where it's not peer reviewed, which we're determined not to be, and where you can fly a kite, you can try out an idea subject to editorial process, we don't want, we don't publish <laughs> half-baked, but, but something, it could become part of something you work on later in a different form. There is the platform. This is quite a serious question. So if we start noticing the proliferation of research-based or practice-based research art PhDs, at a certain moment, we start also noticing changes to artistic practices that are represented in the microcosm in which any magazine operates. So have you started noticing either maybe the, a, a difference in the type of claims that artists make on behalf of the work, or rather the, the, the kind of demands that the critiques of work that are produced in these kind of tracks Demand. I mean, is is, is well, are things changing, or is it still is just completely a bubble of of, of the academic? It is. It is. It's bound to change. It's bound to change. Um, but I'm afraid, that, as always, the most interesting artists, and therefore the most interesting conversations, are with those who can handle this, make it their own, redirect it. Cameron Rowland's piece at the ICA that I talk about in the book, about that addresses slavery. There's reams of stuff to read. And it's absolutely riveting. But the research is nevertheless worn lightly because he's done, like I say, all the work. <laughs> and then you can read it. 
as much as you want or as little as you want, but it will take you deeper and deeper. And all the while, you're in this space and you realize he's getting into your head because it's pretty empty unless you trip over something. And, you know, it's, it, it is brilliantly orchestrated. And then he's in your head. I liken it to um, Bruce Nauman's, you know, get out of my head, where he screams, get out of my head, get out of my head. And at the end of this, you're almost doing that with Cameron Rowland, yet there's not a sound. So this is just, and oh, it makes hairs on the back of my neck. I mean, this is what art can do. It is just not creativity, art. <laughs> can do this because he has found a way. Or oh, I, I, I mentioned um, um, Hilke Takala. You know, these people have been through the system and somehow come out of it <laughs> and not doing what I call QED art, you know, yeah. just demonstrating the theory. And you get a big tick from your tutor, but a big X from the critic, you know, because it's tedious and it, it belongs in the classroom, it belongs in the academy. Of course it will change practice, but the best, most interesting conversations will be around art that handles it. And there are only some who can do that. There were only some who could make 18th century academic tedious study after the plaster cast into <laughs> something that was a poussin, you know. Um, that is life. So I never despair, but I do hope that more and more students like the letters that are published in the book and have been published in the magazine and in other magazines and online who protest that it is not a discipline like other disciplines, that it should be allowed its own internal logic. And that's why perhaps they do need to study history. Then they would know more about that. Ah, well, that's a fascinating recommendation because you, I mean, it's not not for not for the interview, not for publishing, but you know, my my research is exactly the opposite. It states that disciplinary rules are a good idea, and I don't mind what they are. Mm. They just need to exist, and I really take take issue with people like Charles Esch, who claims that you know a disciplinarity is the best thing that art can do. Oh. Right, you know, with like essentially, let's teach nothing. So, so I'm kind of encouraged that you hear. You know yeah. what? There's there's yeah. still a practice. There's still a context. Yes, of course. And is. and once you've got that as a as a basis, then the interface with other disciplines, I think, is exactly. incredibly useful. Exactly. Let's do nothing, because you're going to have to figure out what your practice is after you've left. Yeah. And the problem is. Artists can't do that because mm. after they've left, they're broke and they're yes. dealing with yeah. things that don't really, yeah. the art isn't yeah. great at helping with. So, well, this is processing yeah. artists. It's not teaching. This is processing. Yeah. And it's reprehensible. And at that point, I think maybe we have, we're processing too many of them for their own good, but that's not <laughs> addressing your concern. And if you, I share your, I share your interest and I share your passion. I share your excitement at what it is that artists can do when they do it mm -hmm. because i think the odds of success are so low that it's but they always were they always it, were they always were the the only time they weren't was up to the renaissance when mm. you did your apprenticeship if you were Tadeo gaddi you decided you didn't want to open your own studio. You'd stay with Piotr because he was so successful and you would do your thing. And, you know, they became related in family and they bought land and became very successful. And they knew what the, the jobs were there. They had to compete, of course. And, and you know, if you painted for one guild, then the other guild was... It. <laughs> or if you were really successful, all the other guilds wanted you. So there was competition, there was all those things. But the work was there. And of course, the guilds did actually control how many um, people matriculated in the guild and all that, and how many entered the guild. But they needed the fees. It was not so different. They needed the fees. They needed the money. It's kind of fascinating in the history of, uh, you, cl you clearly have studied, but a history of the idea of a master, of, you know, who it is that's qualified to be an artist of any sort. Visual art is very, very funny, and it goes through in the 20th century for this kind of crisis of legitimation yeah. because conceptual art, which is your, your kind of coming of age, yeah. um, suddenly anyone can be an artist, yeah. but 
it takes about 20 years before the art school says, no, 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 mm. no, no. Yeah. Who do you think you mm. are? You're not yeah. paying half, half our salaries yes. anymore. Yes. One of the things that people outside Britain and, and, and certainly up to now wouldn't know is the unbelievable hostility to the visual arts in this country. And we're not taught we're not taught contemporary art at school. I was in a museum, I think it was French Park, and I was looking at the Zero Gupa mm -hmm. work, which I like, and Gunter Erkner in particular, I was looking at this, and there were kids on the floor drawing, answering questions, fascinated, teacher telling them about. I thought I was twenty one before I'd even looked at something like that, you know, when, when I took myself off and saw the Piero Manzoni and Eve Klein show and, and started to think, you know, um, if you go to, and I went to the National Gallery, I know that's not the place to go for contemporary art, but the level at those same kids, same age, they had been given a Hunt the Dragon, Hunt the Dragon, how many dragons can you find in the gallery? And I, I thought the contrast. And it's, there is, it, it's absolutely, a, it's one of the things I was saying in Germany once, that you don't understand that because all the headlines about Fries, YBA, Damien Hurst, all this stuff, um, you object to the R, I object, I object to the B, <laughs> the YBA, <laughs> but whatever we object to. I said, you don't understand how new this is, how skittish, how unrooted, how shallow-rooted, um, because the culture in, uh, in the UK is literary. Michael Craig mm -hmm. Martin has always emphasised this, made this point everywhere. Visual art is seen as too easy. There's a great story I, I, I used to tell my students, Aloysius Senefelder, who invented the lithograph, mm -hmm. lithography presser, brought it to London, part of the university <laughs> at the period, at least the richest country. And he took it, made an appointment, and went to show it to the president of the Royal Academy. He didn't get the president of the Royal Academy in. Initially, he got Henry Fuseli, as we call him, Henry Fuseli. And he had a go and he said, ah, oh, never catch on, far too easy. <laughs> that is the hard-won image. It leads directly to the hard-won image. And there is still this bourgeois thing in this country. You don't work hard enough. It's not difficult enough. You can't see the detail. Oh, you cannot believe the, the level of conversation. It's to be expected in a way because of the arrogance of thinking that all that contemporary art stuff is for other people. It's not for me at school. Kids aren't taught this. Art teachers are an add-on. And now, of course, nothing because of funding has been taken away from the visual arts from, uh, and placed in for STEM subjects, science and technology. Yeah. So do you think this... Any way in which this moves, like like the Arts Council's recent strategy to let's create, I mean, which replaced great art for everyone, which then replaced art for everyone, <laughs> dropping the great, and now it's everyone is an artist, therefore yes. you decide whether you're great or whether you need to be great. But there is this kind of fundamental tension between culture, democracy, and democratization of access to art. Exactly. And the, the, the principles in which... You know, on papers, these things could work, but they sort of don't. And is it that, that Britain is just fundamentally not suited to, to contemporary art beyond a pursuit of the elite? I mean, we, it's, it's not really. We've just yeah. now expanded yeah. The, yeah. The, the artistic workforce, but that's not necessarily yeah. to say that, that contemporary art represents Britain as it is. Yeah. Like, it's impossible. They're, yeah. they're different populations. I know analogies are not always good, arguing by, beware, um, arguing by analogy. <laughs> well, you're an editor, so you, you <laughs> might have those rules. I don't. But I remember being told at university, oh, girls always get um, two ones. 
boys get first and third. I was so angry and I said, and I'll tell you why. Girls work hard because they haven't had long enough to take university for granted. Men can have fun, get a third and get a job, or be brilliant and get a first. Women may get more two ones. They also, thank you very much, get first, particularly in our department. Did you? But, <laughs> no, but that, that was too good, too good an opportunity. <laughs> I set store by these things. But what annoyed me about that conversation was, you can. It takes years to abuse a privilege. Oh yeah. And art, artists in this country, contemporary art is a new flower. It's new. It doesn't. It sounds ridiculous speaking to people from mainland Europe. To say that, but it is it it the proliferation of art schools happened in the sixties. Almost everything we were born in the sixties, really, and it takes a long time for art to become something you just think of as normal, as something you can abuse, as something you take for granted, and we don't. Then you can play with it. Then you can do what you like. Then you can feel free. But we don't. We don't feel like that. We do, but we, everyone feels they can write a novel, write a play, write a book. Um, they feel entitled. They feel empowered. They feel that's their culture. But the visual arts is a poor relation in this country. It's not respected. It's not. And so people are not steered that way. Um, it's not reflected in our education. I mean, as the, the modern, as far as I got at my art education at A level, and I did. Art history, and you were only allowed to get up to the pre Raphaelites, for heaven's sake. Yeah, it's like that story that at Oxford, English literature ended on Virginia Woolf, and that was. That's right. Was this, there's nothing in the contemporary. Well, modern history yeah. at Oxford is medieval history. I mean, that the rest is journalism. <laughs> 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 uh, now, we have a lot since... of work to do to. To take art for granted, which is actually, mm. in that a way, what you kind have of necessary. to do. Yeah. And then it's really interesting that so much contemporary art in this country, and maybe this is just kind of a prism of the last year, that so much contemporary art is so explicitly political and so explicitly politically active. I don't think that I would be expecting to see that happening in France. Yeah. I definitely would be expecting to see some of it in the US, but then... There are class elements that are even more more ingrained, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so the questions of art activism in the US are very different than the questions of art activism in the UK. And yeah. I think there is there is possibly something changing. Have you... Oh, I do. I feel very yeah. positive. I feel absolutely thrilled by some of the art that's coming out now and the writing because they go together. You can't have good criticism when the, you're talking about dross, can you really? I mean, you can have good criticism, um, but then it becomes writing. There you go. It becomes writing because you're not interested in the art. The best criticism, you must be as interested in both. They become coterminous. You know, they become so ingrained within each other. That's the best. Um, but then if it just becomes writing, you're off on somewhere else. You know, I'm so excited by people going through so much zero hour contracts, debt at university. They're carrying all this. And I feel, you know, I had a grant, we had grants in my, and we did so much less than these people are doing. We took so much for granted. <laughs> and they can't take anything for granted. Mm -hmm.